anyway, so I'm Jeff Stukely. I work in Austin doing chip design. So I'm a chip designer guy. So my slides uh, may be a little bit not as polished, and I may talk a little bit about details that might be boring, but hopefully it's fun. I'm giving an update on Power 9, which is the processor in that system you saw there. Um, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about what we're doing in future processors as well and sort of how we're differentiating those relative to our previous one. So uh, we have families of processors now. Uh, Power 9 is the one we just started doing. That's between 2017 is when we started shipping that system. We'll actually have Power 9 systems coming out, new variants of it into the future. Uh, Power 10 is my day job and that's kind of a 2020 plus type of system. I'll get into more details in a little bit. But this is our uh, yeah, chip guy picture. So here is a Power 9 processor. These things are kind of interesting. We have 8 billion transistors on these, which is always impressive. If you go walk this to a lay person and say, how many transistors do you think are on this microprocessor? Um, nobody ever says 8 billion. They usually say a much smaller number. But this is a 14 nanometer process. We do have EDRAM cells in this device. And so you'll see things like we have 120 megabyte on-chip cache. So extremely large, low latency cache, which we find to be quite useful for a variety of workloads. But essentially we have uh, this particular variant has 24 cores on it, 24 cores. Uh, lots of acceleration capability, which is a foundation of uh, a lot of our HPC systems. So we have connectivity, for example, our PCIe is at Gen 4. So we connect to that Mellanox NIC at Gen 4 PCIe speed. So we're the first in that space. Um, we also have connectivity in a bunch of 25 gig signaling. So when we talk to the NVIDIA GPUs, we're communicating with NVLink version 2, which runs at uh, basically 25 uh, gigahertz on the signaling. We've actually got 48 lanes running at 25 gig talking to the GPUs which gives us a tremendous amount of bandwidth between the host processor memory and the, and the GPU itself. Other things worth mentioning here, uh, we have uh, lots of this, this 25 gig stuff, is, we'll get up to that later. But one thing we really like, especially with this going forward, is using these differential signalings to communicate between processors, accelerators, and even memory. Um, we find we get much better power efficiency with high frequency um, differential signaling as opposed to uh, traditional signaling approaches. Uh, so our core design itself is very new. It's a brand new microprocessor core design compared to previous generations of power. Uh, the previous microprocessor core was started around our Power 4 generation, which was a 2001 processor. And so we continue to sort of fine-tune that monolithic CPU design up until Power 8, but we found that if we wanted to scale the performance of our design, building a big monolithic core was difficult. And so we ended up, uh, to grow the performance going into Power 9, our microprocessors kind of split up into two parts. You have sort of a front-end instruction fetch scheduler engine, and then you have sort of miniature back-end out-of-order cores. So if you, uh, I think this thing maybe shines, Right, so we've got kind of an instruction front end and then a bunch of little merged pipelines that can do our SIMD operations. And so once we made this design, though, we figured out that we could decide to scale different variants and, and how wide we made it. And so in our uh, commercial space, people running like banking, Oracle databases, they wanted to have big cores. And then in the more traditional space, Linux, they wanted small cores. And so we actually have two different types of cores we build out of the same basic IP blocks for different variants of Power 9. Other things we are uh, wanting to vary between our different marketplaces is for our large uh, applications, we have people who run you know, 32 terabytes of RAM and one SMP. They're looking to get extremely high memory capacity and also there's a memory resiliency component to this. Um, and so we have a solution that does an intermediate buffer when we talk to memory. But then for our dense solutions, and these are things like uh, Google's Power9 deployments or the uh, HPC nodes, utilize a direct attach memory solution. So the direct attach memory solution lets us have better density, uh, better cost factors, um, but not quite as much capacity and reliability and bandwidth as we have over here. 
That said, we are doing quite good on bandwidth. This is eight channels of DDR, 2667, uh, eight channels of DDR. It, the sustained bandwidth is probably actually more like 145 uh, gigabytes per second. But this is extremely, uh, and quite a bit of bandwidth coming into the processor on that side of things. So you can see here, and I'm going to give a little bit of a hint towards the future, um, we really like the density and the, um, the industry standard factor of direct attached memory, but the bandwidth capability and the capacity we can build with this differential solution is, um, is quite compelling to us as well. Because what we really like, the nice part about this is, um, you know, we can swap out buffer chips and attach different types of memory, right? Versus if you go direct attach, you build your processor chip, you can really only one, run one type of memory. Um, and so, a few minutes from now, we'll talk about what we want to do going forward. So these are different variants of Power 9s. You've got SMT4 cores or SMT8 cores, so big cores and small cores, and then you've got different uh, memory subsystem, so direct attached memory or buffered memory. The direct attached memory, direct attached memory ports take up a lot of area around the chip, and so we don't have enough lanes to build big SMPs. So this is only a two socket type of computer. And here we can actually go up to 16 socket computers uh, because the, the physical density of differential signaling compared to DDR signaling is it's much tighter. So we have a lot more chip perimeter here to connect up big SMPs. So the variant that's most relevant to the HPC community is this one, right? A uh, key important thing here is running 25 gig signaling. Uh, we can use that for a variety of things. So we really like the idea of differential signaling, talking to NVIDIA GPUs or SMP interconnect. We're actually talking to, uh, we have an open CAPI interface, which is a, a generic open accelerator interface similar to NVLink but uh, based around uh, more of a, an open standard. So let's uh, talk about that real quick. So we've got, coming off the chip from an I.O. perspective, we're leading in a variety of ways here. We've got PCIe Gen 4. We also have 25 gig signaling. And we can run you know, two different acceleration standards off our 25 gig signaling. And so what goes off OpenCAPI, which is the generic 25 gig signaling, You've got accelerators, memory. This is thinking about like storage class memory being attached to the device. And we've also extended our differential signaling with a future standard to enable um, that differential signaling to talk to DDR type devices. So let's take a look at the roadmap here going forward. So in Power 9 today, we've got two variants. We've got the two I just mentioned, which is the direct attach version and the buffered solution. And what we're doing here, which is quite compelling, is we're building a third version of Power9 that has memory attached with this 25 gig differential signaling. And so what you'll see here is this new memory subsystem. We're going up from 150 gigabytes per second in kind of the HPC node to 350 gigabytes per second of sustained bandwidth into each socket. So that two socket HPC node will have a 700 gigabyte per second memory bandwidth, which is heading you know, far above anything else out there in the world. And how are we doing that? We're doing that by using our 25 gig signaling to talk to the memory devices, which gives us tremendous more bandwidth. Going forward with Power 10, um, we're going to continue to use that differential signaling, but because of new memory technologies that will be available in that time, we're actually going to have 435 gigabytes per second of bandwidth into each socket. So the neat, nice part about this is people think about bandwidth of that realm being really the privy of, uh, of uh, GPUs with HBM memory, but this is getting that level of bandwidth into your main store, right? And so it's useful as we connect GPUs to this because they're trying to get to the main store with higher bandwidth as well with new differential signaling there. This lets us get to tremendous bandwidth levels. Uh, other points in here that's maybe worth noting will be at Gen 5 at that point in time. Uh, there's a new version of NVLink we'll be supporting uh, as going forward. But um, pretty interesting stuff here, especially for HPC. Like this is basically saying, you know, host bandwidth is no longer something you need to be concerned about. Which ties into this uh, last slide I really have here, which is we see differentiation and what can we do to make our computers better. Um, what used to be just, you know, okay, you got to have memory, you got to have I/O. We see the attachment to accelerators, which would have just been called I/O, attachment to network, and also how we attach to memory 
as being extreme ways to differentiate our computing systems going forward rather than just kind of what you need to do. Um, and kind of you can see that here with our GPU solutions. We have a tremendous bandwidth advantage talking to the NVIDIA GPUs than we could have done with uh, by 16 PCIe link. Um, so this is kind of the start of it, but we see going forward uh, that's how we define our computers and how we differentiate our machines going forward. A uh, quick one here, you saw this at the beginning. Uh, we're delivering, the Coral project had uh, three computers. We're delivering two of them. Uh, the third one is not being delivered. Won't say anything else about that. Um, but so we got Summit, this is a 200 petaflop system, and then we got a 125 petaflop in Sierra. So two big supercomputing systems, those are being installed uh, this year, and presumably you'll wanna have uh, those running by um, this year, so. Anyway, that's about all I have to say. Um, could, questions? Fine print. <laughs> Thanks. Any questions or? Yes. Where do you see the market potential for Power9 with the uh, NVIDIA GPUs and NVLink beyond the leadership supercomputing, super, uh, supercomputers? So the biggest, so one thing that you, so if you're gonna take advantage of NVLink, which means you have lots of bandwidth between the processor host memory and the GPU memory, the clearest of differentiation there is if the data set that you wanna operate on doesn't fit in GPU memory. So if you've got two terabytes of data and you want to do GPU acceleration of that, you're very, extremely limited by a PCI link with a traditional solution. And so where do we have that though? Is like GPU accelerated databases is one very clear advantage. So if somebody's got some big pile of data in a column store database and want to GPU accelerate it, um, that definitely is a, is a pretty significant performance win. So that's in a yeah, business case and there's probably three or four of those different uh, GPU accelerated databases that we are supporting on power as well. So there's quite a few options in which particular one you want to use. 